I'm Al O'Quinn, the senior pastor here at Bethany Baptist Church. I want to thank you for joining us on our television broadcast today. It's not by chance or accident that you've joined us today. I pray that as you tune in, you will recognize and realize God had you join us today because he has a message just for you. And so I hope that you'll listen intently and you'll be obedient to the prompting of the Holy Spirit as the Lord speaks to your heart today. I want you to know that we want to pray for you and pray for your needs. And so you can call us at 770-957-4455 and leave your prayer request. Answer machine will come on and you'll leave your request. If no one can answer the phone, please leave it on the voicemail. And we will pray for you. We'll return your call if you leave us a number. And be assured that we'll pray, praying for you and all of your needs. So thank you for joining in the broadcast today from Bethany Baptist Church. I hope you'll come and see us real soon. God bless you, and we'll go to the service right now. Look up, fear not, the angel said, Behold the Messiah's come, the one of whom you read. And as he spoke to men that day, the heavenly hosts around the throne joined in to say, on earth and goodwill to men. Heavenly angels announce his arrival in the town of Bethlehem. Hallelujah to the Lord, sing holy. He was born to save the world from sin. Glory to God in the highest glory. Hallelujah to the Lord. Glorious sound falls on my ears from up above. Glory to God in the highest peace on earth, and goodwill to men. Heavenly angels announce his arrival in the town of Bethlehem. Hallelujah to the Lord, sing holy. He was born to save the world from sin. Glory to God in the highest glory. as we sing of a, one of our great carols together, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Lift your voices with me, would you? Angels from the realms of glory, wing your flight o'er all the earth. Ye who sang creation story, now proclaim Messiah.
standing for prayer please before we pray I'm going to ask Pete Brandon if he would come up <clears throat> we have a presentation to make this morning we want to do that first you know I, I didn't think I would ever be doing this two times within a month um, but God has moved uh, in our church we have trained some people well and they're moving on to some another place of service and uh, this morning, we are um, in a position of saying goodbye to Don and his wife, Jill. Tonight, after the choir makes its presentation, you're invited to a reception uh, in the gym where we will be able to say personally our goodbyes to Don and Jill. But this morning, we want to present him a plaque for his service here. Don? The plaque reads, in recognition, Don Bates... Associate Pastor, Music and Worship, for your faithful service to Bethany Baptist Church, McDonough, Georgia, January 2nd, 2009 through December 14th, 2014. A man's steps are established by the Lord, and he takes pleasure in his way. Don, we want to say thank you for your service here. We love you. We are certainly going to miss you. Um, you have a skill set that is going to be hard to fill. And we just uh, pray God's blessings on you in your new place of service. Bless you. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. Uh, we humble ourselves before you because you're God. And you're worthy of our worship. And that's why we are here today. To honor you to give glory and praise and worship to you, the only God. And Father, we are grateful for every person that's here today. Uh, Father, some have come as family to see their children sing. Uh, some are here because they have been drawn by your spirit to be here today to worship you. And Father, I pray that for whatever reason they're here today, Lord, they're here because they want to be obedient. They want to acknowledge you. And they want to praise you today. And so let us do that today as we continue in our worship and praise. Father, thank you so much for loving us so much that you would send your son to come in the form of a man to live a perfect life, to live a perfectly sinless life. Lord, to pay the penalty for our sins, a, a debt that we could never pay. And Father, you planned all this, your word tells us, from the foundation of the world. And so we thank you and we praise you for that. And Lord, as we continue to worship, we pray that you would be glorified in all that we say, all that we do, all that we sing, all that we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated for just a moment. <clears throat> and we are going to miss Don. Uh, there's not many people that can stand up here and sing and lead music and tap his foot the way that Don can. And I, there's not going to be anybody that can uh, take his place, and we're going to miss Don and Jill tremendously. But we know if you've heard him share how God has worked all this out, you know that he's doing exactly what God has called him to do, and he's being obedient to that. And so we're just going to uh, commit to pray for he and for Jill and their family as they go where God's leading them to go. And God has a person uh, that will come and take his place, and uh, we're going to just... Uh, continue to be obedient to God and seek that person out. So y'all be praying. Uh, after the first of the year, we'll have a search team that'll take care of that, and um, we'll just keep you informed of how all of that's going. I want to uh, encourage you, if you would, to make sure that you look at the bulletin. There's a lot of information uh, in the bulletin about what's going on over the next several weeks. One of the things that we want you to be aware of is the schedule change. Starting next Sunday morning, we won't have two services. We won't have an 8.30 and 11 o'clock. We'll just have 11 o'clock. So we'll have Sunday school and 11 o'clock service. And we'll do that until the second Sunday in January. So we'll have three Sundays that we'll all meet together just one time at 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary for worship. But I do want to encourage you to be here for Sunday school uh, at 9.45. It's a great opportunity for fellowship. So I encourage you uh, to do that. <clears throat> right now, I want to welcome our guest 
and I see some faces uh, here this morning uh, that I don't recognize, and we're glad that you're here today, and that God has uh, brought you here uh, to worship with us, and we want to make you feel welcome and, and feel a part of our service today, and so I know our church family is going to greet you and make you feel welcome. There's a guest card, though, in the pew rack in front of you. It's a little blue card. If you would take just a moment to fill that out and put it in the offering plate in just a little bit, we'd love to have a record of your visit with us today and have the opportunity to say thank you for being here and just tell you more about what God is doing at Bethany and keep you informed of what's going on and hopefully have the opportunity to get to know you better and you to get to know us better. So if you'd do that for us, we would appreciate it very much. Now I just want us to stand and greet each other. Make sure that you make our guests feel welcome this morning, church family. Welcome to worship. Welcome to worship. We are the third through fifth grade children's choir, and we are here to celebrate Jesus' birth with you. The prophet Micah said that the king would be born in a little village called Bethlehem. Micah said that his greatness would reach the end of the earth. The prophet Isaiah said that the Lord would give us a son when the king was born. The son would be that a young woman would give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel. The angels announced Jesus' birth, told the shepherds that they can announce the, the Savior's birth. Um, he, he'll be wrapped in smiling clothes and be lying in a manger. There are so many signs that point to Jesus, and we are here to point to Jesus as well. Just like the prophet Isaiah gave us a sign, God gave us a sign. The king is born in Bethlehem, and we're going to sing about it. Those prophets were amazing. They predicted what would happen, when it would happen, and where it would happen. And they were right. Their prediction has changed the whole world. They changed the, ch Jesus changed the whole world. 
First Corinthians 8, 6 says that there's one Lord, Jesus Christ, and because of him all things exist and we exist. The only reason we're here today is because Jesus is the Son of God. The baby in the manger is the Savior of the world.
We are going to sing about the joy Jesus brings to us with the remarkable version of the all-time favorite carol, Joy to the World, the Lord Has Come. Baby Keen, what? that brought joy to the world, is here right now, and we worship him. First Chronicles 29, 11 says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours. O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We, we adore you as the one who is over all things. The angels adored Jesus on that first Christmas night. Mary and, Je Mary and Joseph adored Jesus as they held him in their arms. Shepherds adored Jesus as they saw God lying in the manger. Let's adore Jesus with our song. Yeah. 
Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for leaving heaven's throne to be our king. We lift you high as we worship you now. We adore you as the baby in the manger and Lord and King of Kings and Lord of Lords who live today. Amen. Again, we want to mention to you tonight the uh, music. We encourage you to come. And, uh, of course, uh, tonight, Pete's already mentioned, reception follow for our Jill and Don. And so you want to be here for that. And I know your heart will be blessed in that presentation uh, tonight. Don and Jill will be going to uh, Kissimmee, Florida. Now you say, Kissimmee? Well, today is Deborah and I, our 40th anniversary. And... Uh, We went to uh, Disney World, and I wanted to stay in a romantic place. So I said, Deborah, I got us a room called the Stagecoach Inn in Kissimmee. <laughs> and so we were on our way, and she said, I don't think you say Kissimmee, I think it's Kissimmee. I said, it's not, it's romantic, it's Kissimmee. And she said, it's Kissimmee. And we started going back and forth to one another. And she said, just pull in here. We're going to go in here and ask this guy to say the name of this place real slow. And you'll see. I'm right. So we went in and she said, sir, would you say the name of this place real slow so my husband can get it? Because he's really confused. The guy said, okay, I'll say it. Dairy Queen. <laughs> That really didn't happen. But anyway, <laughs> you want to be here. We pray for them. They're going to Kissimmee, and uh, we'll miss them. We pray God to be with them and bless them. I want to uh, take just a moment and talk about our response at worship <clears throat> and how we respond at worship to the birth of Christ. And the scripture is found in Luke chapter 2, verse 15 through 20. And when the angel of the Lord went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go into Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which as the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherd had told them. And look at verse 19. <clears throat> But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as had been told to them. Lord, thank you for our hearts have already been blessed through worship today. We do know, Lord, that out of the mouths of children, babes, infants, you have perfected praise. And I pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing and acceptable to you. Take it and use it for your honor and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the question today is, how are you feeling about Christmas? You know, today's the 14th and you'll be here before you know it. Uh, how, how you're feeling about Christmas? Uh, is there a right way, a wrong way to celebrate Christmas? Well, I think there is. And there are many things that characterize Christmas and many themes that characterize Christmas. And it doesn't mean they're wrong, but is it the best perspective on Christmas? We talk about peace on earth, and we all want peace on earth, but there won't really be peace on earth until people uh, uh, come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and he sets up his millennial kingdom. But the only way any individual could have peace is to know Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, because he gives peace. Some think of it as a spirit of giving. And certainly it is the spirit of giving. Uh, in Thanksgiving, churches really get in gear and begin to give to those less fortunate. And Christmas, we give. <clears throat> I had a friend of mine down in Savannah who ran a mission center. And the Union Mission took in homeless people. He said, you know, Al, every Thanksgiving and Christmas, church people go crazy about taking care of the unprivileged and the homeless. But they're still underprivileged and homeless all year long. And it seems like the churches disappear. 
Well, giving. We should be giving. It is a time of giving. It is the spirit of giving. But also it's the time of joy and gladness, certainly. It's a time of showing kindness to our fellow man. And all those things are well and good. But they should flow out of the proper response to Christmas. And the proper response to Christmas is worship. It may be that you're like me. Sometimes you see what's happening in the season of Advent and it bothers you. People want to say happy holiday or make it a holiday. It's a holy day. It's a day we celebrate Christ Jesus. There'd be no Christmas without Christ. It's about the fulfillment of Scripture, though. That's what Christmas is. The world doesn't understand that. Lost humanity doesn't understand that. The, the, the celebration of Christmas is the fulfillment of Scripture of the Lamb of God coming to be sin for us. Choir presents a powerful presentation of that in the Christmas presentation this year, the Lamb of God. Christmas is the fulfillment of the prophetic word that was given in the Garden of Gethsemane, or, or in the Garden of Eden, rather. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had sinned, and, and the Lord sought them out. He knew where they were. And uh, as a result of their sin, Adam and Eve, they would die, but the Lord would respond, and he did respond. God responded, and he made a promise. And he said this in Genesis 3, 13, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The Messiah would come, and the head of the serpent would be crushed. Christmas is about the coming of a redeemer. Christmas is about the Virgin Mary giving birth to the Son of God, God incarnate, God in the flesh. We worship the Savior. That's what Christmas is all about. We celebrate his having come into the world to deliver us from sin and death and the penalty of death. That's what Christmas is all about. But so often there's a missing part and a missing piece for many people, even those who say they're followers of Christ. And the missing part and the missing piece is worship. Christmas is about worship. I would never suggest to you this morning that there's anything wrong with decorating and with gifts and with family traditions and the customs of joy, of gladness. I wouldn't tell you anything's wrong with Santa Claus. I love Santa Claus. As a matter of fact, if I was blessed like some of you guys with DNA to grow a beard, if I could grow a beard and have white beard and white hair, hey, I like Santa Claus. But understand something, that's not the spirit of Christmas, all of it. That's not the real perspective of Christmas. That's not it at all. The, the ad most adequate response to Christmas is not the gifts and Santa Claus and the food. And I like the food, can you tell? But anyway, it's about worship. It's about worshiping a Savior. And our first priority is to worship. And it's not to suggest that we need more religious activity or we need another church program. It's to humbly become before the Lord and worship. So Christmas is about worship. And every day of our lives is about worship. We must worship as portrayed in the Bible. Worship portrayed in the Bible is a very practical thing. Very practical it is to worship as portrayed in the Bible. Think about this. It is to sacrifice. Romans 12 says we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, for this is our reasonable service. So we're to sacrifice. A priest would sacrifice and worship. You and I are to sacrifice the calves of our lips in worship and praise. It is to give. The Bible says it's more, more blessed to give than to receive. The Bible says to be a joyful giver, that we should give joyfully. Jesus gave of himself. God gave his son to be the Savior of the world. It is to give. It is to serve others. And Jesus demonstrated that when he girded his loins with a towel and he washed his disciples' feet. And he says, as I have done to you, go and do to others likewise. And then it's proclaiming good news. That's what worship is all about, telling the good news. See, the practical aspect of worship, that's what we are to be about. We are to be sacrificing, giving, serving others, and proclaiming the good news. Many, many years ago, there was a guy named Don Francisco. His father was a professor of theology at Southern Seminary. And Don Francisco wrote a song called, I Gotta Tell Somebody. The story is about a guy who experienced the miracle touch of God, Jesus. He was blind. He could not see. He regained his sight. He could see. And his response was, I gotta tell somebody. I gotta tell somebody what Jesus did for me. When Matt was a little, little kid, he was probably five or six, four or five, I'd come home and uh, we had a lady that stayed with him during the day. Deborah just started to work. And he'd have a uh, egg beaters, you know, apple mixer, 
holding it like a microphone, and he'd be singing. I got to tell somebody. He'd heard that song by Don Francisco. Got to tell somebody. Got to tell somebody what Jesus did for me. To, to worship is to give, it's to sacrifice, it's to serve others, but it's to tell others what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord, what? Say so. And so it's a practical aspect of worship. But I also want you to know, worship sets the pace for celebrating Christmas. Worship sets the pace for celebrating Christmas. Now you choose your respect or perspective of worship. How are you going to work? What are, are celebrating Christmas? You choose your perspective. And you think about all the things that we're bombarded with. For some people, the perspective of Christmas is it's just always sentimental. And there's nothing wrong with being sentimental, but that's not the priority. But there are those that choose that sentimental perspective, a time for family, a time for children, a time for doing good and wonderful emotions. And certainly we enjoy our family and we enjoy being family together. And certainly when things change in life and a family member is missing, it's very difficult. But understand, church, the priority of celebrating Christmas is not from that sentimental aspect. It is worship. There's the human perspective Celebrating our love for our fellow man, the spirit of giving, showing benevolence. That's good. That's what we're to be about. But that's not the priority of worship, and that's not the priority of celebrating Christmas. There's the hedonistic perspective. It's just another holiday. It's a reason to party. Many, many years ago, there was a lady came to me, and she said, You're not going to understand what I'm about to say to you. I knew she was a believer. She says, I don't like Christmas. I said, what? She said, I don't like Christmas. Maybe she should have said, I don't like what Christmas has come to be in my family. She says, when we go to my husband's family, there's a lot of drinking. And by the end of the day, a lot of those guys are drunk. And there's a lot of arguing and a lot of fighting. It just kills it all. I don't like Christmas. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to be. The perspective of Christmas, it's not the sentimental thing, or the humanistic thing, or the hedonistic thing. It's the biblical perspective, a season to reflect on the goodness and the grace of our great God. That's what Christmas is all about. And so, here's, this guides us. This, the narrative, the biblical narrative, the Christian narrative guides us in this idea of worshiping Christmas. The recipients of the good news, we read about that. The recipients of the good news respond in worship. Think about it. The recipients of the good news of the birth of a Savior respond in worship. And you'll notice that, that the first responders were the shepherds. The shepherds received the word. The Bible says, it's very clear, we read the narrative. They're just watching their sheep by night and suddenly the angel of the Lord appears and as the angel of the Lord appears, they were afraid. He says, don't be afraid. Behold, we bring you great news of great joy, which will be to all people. For born to you this day in the city of David is a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. He is the Savior of the world. Now, you know what the shepherds did? And I want to tell you this before I get into that. This is just like God. This is just like God to do this. It was not to the high priest the news came of the Savior's birth. It was not to the religious establishment that the good news came of the Savior's birth. It was not to the high muckety-mucks who were something in the religious jargon and the religious establishment. But the Lord God allowed the news of a Savior coming Go to the lowest level of the culture and society of that day. He took the news to the lowly, humble shepherds who were outcasts. Nobody liked the shepherds. Nobody wanted to be around the shepherds. They on the last rung of the ladder of anybody would want to be on. They're shepherds. They work with sheep. They stink. They smell. They, they lead sheep. Well, where did the Lord God send the message of the great news? To the humble, lowly shepherd. To the lowly shepherds who were overlooked and looked down upon because of their low status in society. 
They went immediately. They didn't wait. When they received the news, they made haste and they found the baby with Mary and Joseph wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger. And their praises rang out for all to hear. And they exhorted others to worship the newborn king. They celebrated. They worshiped the newborn king. They made haste. You know, when I read about that and I see how they responded and how God had responded, allowing the news to go to the holy shepherd. And you look at the life of the ministry of Jesus. He was always in those places where most people would never go. He always walked slowly through a crowd. He associated with the leper, the outcast, the harlot, the tax collector, the Pharisee, the down and out. He, he was with those folks that nobody else wanted to be around. That was his ministry. And the fact that the news came to that kind of people to start with says a whole lot about the reason he came. He came to save and to seek that which was lost. And it matters not one's status in society or one's status in culture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, the shepherd... The harlot, the leper, you and me. If we believe in him, we should not perish, but have everlasting life. And in that narrative, we see another group that worships. In, in Matthew 2.11, it's the worship of the Magi. The biblical narrative, the Christmas narrative. They respond to the good news. Those those stargazers watching the star saw the star and knew something significant happened. And they followed the star to find Jesus. And as they came, they brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. They brought the best they had to offer. They did not come empty-handed. They gave from their heart. And notice the gifts that they gave. They gave gifts fit for a king. They gave gold. Gold is fit for a king. They gave myrrh. Myrrh was to embalm. He was a suffering servant. They gave frankincense, which is a symbol of prayer. Now, I want you to think about the gifts. He gave gold. He's a king. He is a king. Jesus was asked by Pontius Pilate, Are you a king? Yep. But my kingdom's not of this world. But one day he will come as king of kings and lord of lords. He's a king. They gave him gold, gift for a king. They gave him frankincense, a symbol of of prayer. Where is our Lord God Jesus right now? He's standing at the right hand of God the Father, ever interceding for us, our advocate. That is an appropriate gift. Frankincense. He is pray. Jesus prays for you, dear people. Prays for me. Frankincense and myrrh used to embalm. It's a symbol of suffering. They brought their gifts fit for a king. I'll ask you, what are you gonna what would what would Jesus have us give him? It's his birthday. I just celebrated my 39th birthday. And um, <laughs> gifts are fun. We we'll celebrate the Lord's birthday. What does he want? What do we give him? Well, you know, this time of the year, everybody's busy trying to type, pick out the perfect gift and agonize and get stressed over the perfect gift. And actually, most of us don't really need anything. There may be a few things we want. We don't need anything. And what would be the perfect gift that we give Jesus as we celebrate his birth? You know what he really wants? Can I tell you? He wants you. He wants you. He wants your love. He wants your devotion. He wants your heart. He wants you. That's all he wants. He just wants you. He wants your time. He wants your presence. He wants your heart. He, he wants you. That's what you give him this Christmas. And, and then you would give him not only yourself, you would give him your family, you would give him your possessions. To, he would say, say to you, you know, I want you and everything that you are. The Bible says, cast all your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. And Christmas time can lend itself to a lot of despair and disillusionment and depression. He wants you with all your cares and your heavy heart. He wants you. Just cast all those upon the Lord. Whatever you lay before the Lord Jesus, he receives. But most of all, he wants you. We worship like the Magi. They, they gave fit, gifts fit for a king. And thirdly and lastly, when you notice about worship, the batter, b pattern of worship and worshiping like they worshiped in the Christmas narrative, it says in that 19th verse of the second chapter of Luke, it says that 
that Mary did some personal reflection. She pondered those things, treasured them in her heart. What is, what is the response, proper response to Christmas? It's worship. It's to worship like the shepherds. It's to worship like the magi. It's to worship like Mary. Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. What did Mary do? Mary worshiped through quiet reflection. She paused and she worshiped in quiet reflection. I can tell you something about our world we live in. It doesn't like quiet. We don't like quiet. I'm going to tell you. What's the first thing many of us do when we walk in the house? Turn on the TV. What's the first thing you do when you get in your car? Turn on your radio, turn on your CD. What's the first thing when you get up, you put your buds in your ear and turn on your iPod? We don't like quiet. We have a hard time with quiet to do personal reflection, just to be still. And notice Mary was quiet. She was still. She pondered all those things in her heart. Solitude is hard for us. And what did the psalmist say in the 42nd Psalm? Be still. I'll tell you, when your heart is heavy and your life is troubled and you're trying to get a clue from God, you won't find it in the hustle and bustle and turn every rock. It's when you decide to be still and sit still before Jesus and sit at the feet of Jesus and you're still, still, still quiet. And you wait on the Lord in quiet reflection. Because you have the Holy Spirit within you, He will speak to your heart. Quiet reflection. And he'll speak to you. And you'll begin to reflect on your life. I was dead in sin and trespasses, and the Lord Jesus called my name. And now I am a child of God. You'll begin to reflect on all the goodness and all the blessings and all the treasures. And you will begin to celebrate and worship the Savior who came at Christmas, the incarnate of God. Personal, quiet reflection. You know what I would challenge you to do on Christmas Day is certainly you need to have some time with your family when you're gathered around and you thank the Lord God that he came and the Lord Jesus came, born of the Virgin Mary, the Son of God, God incarnate. And then you and I need to have personal quiet reflection just alone with God, just alone with God, just us individually, alone with God to do personal reflection at Christmas because our world is in such a mess, isn't it? We need a Savior we need a Savior. We need a Savior. In this hustle and bustle season, Deborah and our daughter-in-law went shopping yesterday, and they, they went out toward Coles, and, that, and Deborah called me. She said, I don't know if I'll ever get out of this parking lot. She said, there's no way out. I, I can't, the traffic's backed up here, it's backed up there. My response was, good luck, you'll figure it out. But anyway, <laughs> guys, that's why we don't shop. So anyway, but we, it's a good thing to shop. But you know what? She, she said, how did you do this when you came the other day? I said, well, I went back to the main road, and I just did the best I could to get out. You know, gr driving across the busy highway. Just do, and, and, you know, everybody's out trying to do their thing, trying to shop, trying to buy the perfect gift. It can be very stressful. But we need to understand about Christmas what it's all about. It doesn't have to be that way. In the hustle and bustle of the season, don't forget the reason for the season. is to worship the Christ. A gentleman was doing his Christmas shopping in a very busy mall. The place was very crowded and people were stressed and stretched and very impatient with one another. Sounds like Black Friday to me. Day after Thanksgiving. The place was very crowded. People were stressed. They were stretched and they were very impatient with one another. A lady trying to manage two children, had reached the point of her exasperation, and she shouted at this man, whoever started this mess ought to be killed. And the gentleman responded, they did, lady. But this isn't the reason. He came. He came to give us life. He came into his own. And his own received him not. Why did he come? He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus is a reason for Christmas. Not all the chaos associated with the season. 
We've made it, it busy. We've made it stressful. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus says, just worship me. So how will you do Christmas? What will be your perspective? Let's do it like those in the Christmas narrative and worship. Would you pray with me? Father, in these moments, we thank you for every good and perfect gift that you bestow upon us. You are our great God, our Lord, our Savior, our King. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to love you. And in this Christmas season of Advent, help us to know why we celebrate Christmas. It's because your Savior came. And help us to keep it in perspective. It's not about all that this world and we have made it. It's about a Savior who's come to give us life everlasting. To which we say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving us. If there's someone here today that doesn't know you, I pray you'd lift the veil from their eyes and they'd see their need of a Savior. And Lord, for us who are believers, help us do some personal evaluation, inventory of what we've made Christmas. And we'd make it the way you'd have us to make it. Just to worship a Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed the message today and the time of worship. And I pray that you sense the Lord's presence right there where you are in your own home or in a hotel room or wherever you're watching the service today. We hope that uh, you sense the presence of the Lord. And hope you'll be faithful to tune in every Sunday on this channel at this time to watch the broadcast. I want you to know that Bethany Baptist Church is located at the corner of Highway 81 and uh, Bethany Road. And we encourage you to come and uh, visit with us. If you have prayer concerns, please call us at... Uh, our church number 770-957-4455. Or you can email us at uh, www.4nbethany.org. And uh, we'll be glad to hear from you, take your prayer requests, and I assure you that we will pray over your needs. So thank you for joining us and look forward to uh, you being with us again next Sunday. God bless you.